here we are, we're in pins, uh, the wonderful pins, it's a gorgeous uh, roof garden here, be able to see it whilst we're talking, but also in general uh, around the whole place on Duke Street, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, so thank you very much for that, uh, I've got Sean, uh, I've got Mo and I've got Chris, and Mo, you know, the first part of this is it's been eight days since Alexis McAllister but transfers do funny things to time yeah. because there was three or four days where we all thought McAllister was done. So it becomes 12 days and then it becomes a little bit of, what are we waiting for? But then the flip side is, well, what's everyone waiting for? What's <laughs> everyone waiting for? Like the season You can't all buy Yori Tielemans. No, <laughs> and I mean, thank goodness for that. <laughs> like like the, 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 the transfer season hasn't really kicked off yet. Like there's been a few little bits like for us, obviously, but there's not been the big deal that makes other deals happen. And I think, there's always that point in the summer where there's one move which begats another, begats another, begats another. And we haven't got there yet. Like, for Liverpool, I kind of feel a bit sorry for them because this is exactly the same thing that happened two years ago, if we can all remember, with Ibu. We got him in really early and then everyone was just like, what now? But then there was no more. So it was kind of justified. Now, I'm a little bit more confident in saying there definitely will be more. So, yeah, maybe we need to be patient, but then, you look at the players we're in for, the profile of them, they all seem to be going to this one tournament that's happening, what, next week is it? Yeah. So we'd like to get something done by then, maybe even if it's just a kind of an agreement that's not officially done till afterwards, but it feels like that's the time to do it. It feels like he's got, Chris, three, four weeks, they've got three, four weeks before his own thing, which is that he wants them all in for pre-season and so on. I'm, you know, I think I think he's very much about that. He loves pre-season. He loves being able to get to work with them. If they come in a bit later, I don't think he'd want them to rocking up to Singapore uh, as that being the first week as a Liverpool player. You know, after Singapore, there's not a big gap until the first game. Time is ever. You, you think about resource in terms of money, but it's also time, and Liverpool need to give themselves as much time as they can. I think, especially given it really feels like from what you hear in the rumblings, I think he was really unhappy with how last summer went. And, and, and the planning and the, the training programs and you know I, I just feel like that was sort of a bit of a, a bit of a cloud over everything so I think as you say do, what do you do do you jettison them in for a week in Singapore no you don't do that and then at that point you're going well when actually do you start bedding in because this pre-season the way that it's all already getting set up you can see this is very much a Jurgen Klopp pre-season. Yeah. This is very much not a, you know, we've got to be, go over to, you know, this place for three weeks to make sure that we're making all our commercial partners happy. This is very or much moving, a... Or moving three, four times as we Exactly, know, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we, we were in, you know, the US, well, three years ago. It was a whistle-stop tour and it felt like they were on planes more than they were football pitches. This time it feels like he's going to get them in the little camp and they're going to have that mad game where, you know, they're basically they'll lose 5-0 and everyone's heads will fall off. But it's basically <laughs> a training session. Because they've done, yeah, they've done three yeah. training sessions that he's made them play this game. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it really feels like he's going back to... It's not basic because it's actually really sort of nuanced and, and, and detailed. But don't get me wrong, if there's no new signs before then, he'll get the ones who are here up to scratch again. And that's yeah. really important. But my God, we need these signings to, to hit the ground running because Liverpool need that injection. McAllister getting there, that's really, really important. But in a weird way, he's probably the one who will already be in tune with this because he's been playing in the Premier League. He's playing in a style that is very, very, not very, very similar to, to Klopp's Liverpool, but the same sort of idea. I mean, look, look at the way Brighton played against us last, last season. He knows how Liverpool play. Yeah, they, like, they know yeah. it inside Absolutely, out. Whether you've got your Tarand, you've got Kona, you've got all these names that know that moment to Viega, who we'll be talking about, I'm sure. Those are the guys that you probably want to get in a bit earlier so they can get to grips, not just with the, the physical side of things, but the tactical side as well. Yeah. He wants, he wants change, he wants change, Sean, and, you know, that's a change. We've now got the fixtures, you get to see them, and you can see why, you know, I don't think Liverpool need to win either of the first two away games, but my God, they need to look like a football team in them, um, and that will take a little bit of time, and I'll say again, the strange thing is, I'd have thought Newcastle would have done something by now, I'd have thought Manchester United would have done something by now, I'd have thought Arsenal might well have got somewhere on at least one thing by now, it's worth saying that, you know, in the context that we have, but then, they haven't got four or five, well, maybe Man United have, but they haven't got four or five integral parts of this team they need to get sorted. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think um, it's a fine balance, isn't it, transfers, because you've got the football side of things where we're all desperate for to get people in ASAP so we can go to pre-season and really beast them up into his mould and get us playing like a machine for that first game of the season. But then you've got to remember the, the business side of things, the commercial aspect, and you don't want to overpay for someone just because you want to get someone in just to appease us or to appease someone on Twitter or, or even maybe to appease Klopp. 
because like I think the way we've Do you fancy that chat with him? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I think the, I think the club genuinely do though. I, th I think the the way they've sort of operated in the, the transfer policy over the years has been quite ruthless in terms of they, they do what they want and they've got a way of doing it and, and that's it. You know, it's it, we always you know I mean it's it's funny when you see people celebrating that we got McAllister for thirty five million and like as if it's their own money and they made up that we that they saved a couple of quid. You know what I mean? But in a, on a serious note, I think that's a prime example of yeah. All right, it got done early, but look at the deal we got out of that. Yeah. Um, so I feel like we've got to be patient, is what I'd say. But this is my my thing on the, the so McAllister, for instance. The, they pull what they pull and it's 35 plus the add-ons. This is where I think, and this is where there is the conversation with the manager that doesn't involve him ripping Sean's head off, <laughs> where I think Liverpool might be prepared to say, if you want to go fast, it's four. Mm. If you want to go, if we want to go at a certain speed, it's five. If we let the market come to us, it could be six, yeah. six new players. And I think that that's, you know, you know on McAllister, for instance, the, the reason why I was made up with the McAllister fee isn't because it's my money, it's because it made me think, 20 million there that can go towards one more towards yeah. the end of it and that's that's the point of the negotiation but simultaneously I am a bit like that you know yeah. what though I wish that we wouldn't know about that extra 20 million yet because everyone else is giving know about it as well yeah so yeah. like Celta Vigo by Munch and Gladbach uh, Nice they're all going to be like we know you got a deal there so don't come to us yeah. like you're poor and I, that's just another part of the dance yeah I, absolutely and the other thing to remember by the way this whole pre-season thing about getting them in shape for the first game and having a really good pre-season um, he's got to get the, the, the actual players in, in good shape as well yeah. so maybe three or four people that are going to come in and are going to you know hopefully you know come into stars in the midfield or whatever you know, it's important that we get that right it's also important we get the current copper players into shape and get them playing right for the, for the last season so I'm, I'm a little bit less nervous about the pace I think you know in the world we live in with Transfers and like, like, you know, constantly looking at your phone. There's another article about the same player from the same journal. When does Romano sleep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about something. No, there's three of him. There's, there's, three of him. Yeah, there's yeah, definitely some AI stuff yeah. going on there. Yeah. <laughs> but I need you, I, it's a world of Romano. It's like, <laughs> it's like a really weird uh, Philip K. Dick novel. <laughs> The first Lord of Romano. <laughs> yeah, it's a good Netflix documentary. Yeah. You know, it really. I, I am a little bit nervous, and it's not necessarily the physical aspect. I said about tactical before. I think the players we're going for, or and, and look, you know, there might be players that we haven't even heard of or been linked to that we end up with. But there's no player there where I'm going. Well, I can see exactly where he plays. Yeah. Because yeah. number one, I don't know how many people are going to play next season. Exactly. Yeah. Which is a big thing. I'm assuming that we're going to carry on with the trend thing. I assume that that is one of the things that we're really going for. But number two as well, you know, you look at something like Taram. It's not that you can say, well, he's clearly going to play as the six or he's clearly going to play as the right side of the ace. You know, McAllister comes in, you go, I can see that. He's, he's yeah. probably going to be on the left-hand side of that eight. But he can play on the right because that's where he did it under Potter. He can do it as a six, he can do it as a ten. Every other player, whether it's... You can it's change the shape of McAllister, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. These other players, I feel like we've got to get them in and then almost sort of... You know, it's a bit of a, a bit of a cliche, but why not hold them? Yeah. them? Where we sort of go, well, you, you wear that, but you're not anymore. Not 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 now. You're a Liverpool player. You've got to actually do a different sort of uh, <laughs> function. I think the other thing to remember as well about players coming in, because you know everyone's desperate, myself included, to like say, oh, that's where they play and that's the position. The, the lads that were replacing. So you think about Oxley, Chamberlain, and Kaita. They haven't played, so they didn't play. So you're, you're literally replacing squad players to come in, and that is a luxury for us because we're getting squad players to come in. But squad players don't necessarily have, uh, okay, you're playing in this. It's, it's their position. They just fit into the team and they come in and they swap with people. So I feel like you know we don't need to be too hung up on the on the positions. We just need to play, as I say, get the current crop into good shape, and then go from there and see what comes from it. There's loads. The one I'm most excited about in terms of almost refitting him, as Chris suggests, is Taramo. I think. He looks so full of potential, yeah. and a lot of that is obviously the physicality, but I think he just looks so full of potential as a footballer all around. His ability to shift the ball, both feet, um, you know, Harry's been speaking to people all week. <laughs> uh, what she doesn't know about Kevin Saram's not worth knowing. There's more than his mum. Yeah. Uh, and there is, there is something I think where, you know, for me, he does look like the likeliest next one on the one hand, but also I think he makes a ton of sense in that he can almost be whatever Jürgen wants. So it feels like there's going to be a lot of change at Nice this summer and it could potentially work in Liverpool's favour. I don't think the fee is going to be as extortionate as it felt like it was going to be at the start of the window or at the start of when people were starting to talk about this move maybe two, three months ago as well. So I think, you know, Liverpool are in a great position, potentially attracting a player that could you know, on the basis of his performances so far, turn into one of the league's best midfielders. I think he's very technically adept. He's so good at using his body to shield the ball as it comes across him. He's also got a nice turn of pace as well. He's not just some sort of lump. He actually looks like he could 
build out in the next few years. I don't know whether he's completely finished his physical development, which I think is even more exciting as well. Uh, and I think he's quite unlike what a lot of Premier League midfielders have at the moment in terms of the mixture of physicality and technical sort of assuredness as well. He kind of, in a similar sort of way to Mateo Kovacic, kind of reminds me of that sort of profile and that he can do some defensive work, isn't necessarily the finished article in the final third like Kovacic, but has this game-changing ability to get the ball into the final third and can pick a pass as well. So I think he's a potentially really, really exciting and a bit of a game-changer for Liverpool going forward as I do see him becoming one of the best players in Europe in three to four years' time. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think what Chris said is bang on in terms of needing to get him in for that because it's going to be a big ask for him to go from... I mainly needs to play European football, so it's not like they're mugs, but the pressure of not only playing for Liverpool, but basically anyone who comes in from midfield in Liverpool is going to be seen as a saviour. You've got to yeah. be the one who brings us back. And that's pressure in itself. So if you put all that on top of asking to do a new thing, like I think um, Belinda on Twitter said that he's like a short term eight and a project six. I think that that's exactly it. And we've seen Jurgen loves a project. Yeah. He, he, he loves seeing something in a player that no one else has seen and be like, you're doing this, but trust me, you'd be much better if you were doing this. And it normally works, yeah. to be fair to him. So if that is the case, and I can see it being the case, because <clears throat> you're right, his. This kind of game, if you look at it, at the moment he's playing in advanced areas, but he's winning the ball back. And like, yes, winning the ball back is one of those things where it's about anticipation. I, I, I think the advanced areas thing's dead interesting for me though, because Liverpool's advanced areas and most other clubs' advanced areas, Liverpool's starting positions and most other clubs' starting positions, they're 20 yards apart. Yeah. If you're picking it up in a if you're picking it up on the centre circle of the opposing tar for Liverpool, you're not playing as an eight, you're playing as a six. The eight to play by the penalty box. Exactly. And we need someone who gets the ball from there towards the penalty box. That's what I keep looking at and thinking. A lot of what, when you look at where he is and look at the clips and all that sort of stuff, I'm thinking, yeah, but if he's playing for Liverpool, yeah. that I'm almost as bad as <coughs> midfielder, yeah. as, as unlikely as that is, cause, but that's how we play. And even if you were going to ask him to be a little bit deeper, even if it's just 10, 15 yards, you are still asking him to have the same instincts and the same characteristics as a footballer. He's in, like I yeah. say, if you're winning the ball back high up the pitch, just win the ball back about 20 yards further back. It's, it's, it's yeah. the same thing. And the only real issue with that and the thing he's going to have to get used to is the discipline factor of it, the want to kind of get into those areas you used to be. But to be honest, there's probably going to be someone in a red shirt in front of him in that area already. So it would be just like, I can just pass to him. You excited by him, theoretically? From the clips, yeah. You know, absolutely, theoretically. I think you look at his, his numbers, you look at what he can bring. I like the way that he can progress the ball. And I think that's a really big thing. And I think what you say there about it being 20, 20 yards further up is interesting. I think, not to repeat myself, because I think I've said this on a, on, a, on a previous show, but I think one of the things that really dropped off with Fabinho last season, apart from you know when he was on that awful spell in sort of just after Christmas, but one of the big things that dropped Sam off was... Sam Beckett leapt into his body. Sam Beckett leapt into his body on the bench at Brighton. And I don't know what Sam was there to fix. Oh, we can only presume he managed it because he's definitely left back out. I mean, that that, that does explain plays. him absolutely begging to get sent off yeah. that one time. Yeah. 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 I know, I'm out of here. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. Please, please yeah. press the button. I, I have a lot of sympathy with, with Fabiano having just had a baby myself. I I think when he, when he had the baby, he was up doing sleepless nights. He looks the like the type of husband that does do the night feeds as opposed to letting Mrs. do it, I think. Yeah, so we, we're all saying he's too sound, if yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's too progressive a yeah, chap. Yeah. Uh, oh, he's not the only yeah. one. <laughs> um, so, but the way he used that ball, we didn't get the ball forward quickly enough. He couldn't turn on a pivot. I think what you see from Saram and those skills that he shows is that he could pick the ball up on the centre circle and move forward and progress. Yeah. Because we've lost a couple of players. I think Milner was really good at that sort of progression on the pitch last season. I don't think we've really got we've got a we've got a Jones who can go high, yeah. hold it up, bring others into play. What we don't have in that midfield, I think the council will bring it, I think the Schwartz Saram will bring yeah. as well, is getting the ball two feet and progressing it while we've actually got possession and moving forward. In theory, it's what we always thought Keisha could do. Yeah. When Keisha was his yeah. best, that's what he could do. We've lost that to a degree. I mean, we lost it anyway last season. I couldn't believe when I looked at how few minutes Keisha yeah. actually played last year. So I think it'll sort of be that sort of skill set that we'll bring back where get the ball and we can just progress through sheer ability 10-15 yes. yards higher. I, I couldn't agree more. I think I'm actually really excited about Taram uh, as well as McAllister because you can see you can see why they're getting they're being brought in for that exact thing about progressing the ball from and moving this 
between the lines because that's a big thing that we did stop doing. You know, you think about the players who've been really good at that for Liverpool, and, and it's been really good for us in, in terms of how we get forward and, and score goals like that. But Massive is a player that does that. Massive just gets the ball from set, set, yeah. centre half, and all of a sudden he's the most attacking f- f- player further forward. So I'm really excited that we're, we're looking to do that again because I think if we're all honest, I think if Klopp's honest, you look at what we did, what we had last season, and yet we know a, a few things went against us, but. Even in Trent, with Trent with his new position, it's a lot more about just pinging it up and yeah. finding that killer pass as opposed to getting the ball, moving through the lines, getting it there, moving through the next lines. And I think that's been, as much as Preston's been our identity, that's been our identity as well. And it's the best thing against a low block. Like, yeah. if, they're, if you're in if a team who's got discipline, they're not going to move out of it. They have to move if you're running with them at the ball. Mm-hmm. Like, you mentioned the Matic thing, right? I can kind of say this now because I feel like I'm not going to jinx it. <laughs> like, that always worked. Yeah. Like, yeah. always, <laughs> always did, worked. Yeah. They, but they never tackled it. Like, and there was time you could see it in the defender's eyes. They're like, what? Yeah. Am I, am I, and it was yeah. gone. And so you have to have bravery to do that. I mean, particularly to centre half. But I think you need players who are fearless and who can draw other players towards them and then have the intelligence to recycle the ball around them and open up space. I think we've got also a break glass in case of an emergency option in the sense of this all sounds really good and we can do it but you know if it gets a little bit too hairy we'll just give it to Trent he'll ping it around. Exactly. I mean that's a real big thing. I think it's really interesting that a lot of these links only really start to service once we start to play in Trent in this role. So on that, I was going to actually go with Ch- say to you. What's dead interesting is to think about, begin to think about the links that have diminished. So me and you sat on a show about three months ago talking about Shao Polina. Yeah, yeah. And that's now gone completely <laughs> quiet because none of what we're describing, he's not saying he's not a really good player who's impressed the life out of me, but none of this makes sense for Shao Polina, does it? And that's the interesting thing, Yeah, I yeah. Think. And again, I think a lot of people are kind of nervous about us not going after the true six, but I think what you're seeing out of that is that a lot of those players who are true sixes have limitations elsewhere mm. and it's eliminating those kind of limitations that we're after. We want someone who can do that and these other things as well. And yeah, like Pelin is a funny one. Like, I mean, I was thinking at one point that Liverpool were going to end up putting a bid for him in January. I'm thinking Man United are definitely going to snap him up, but now it looks like he might end up at West Ham. So, and that's just over the course of like. Or stay at Fulham. Yeah, yeah, or even stay at Fulham. And, so yeah, there are times when a player is just in a bit of good form, but you've got to look beyond that and just think about, like you say, what are we wanting out of this player in our team? And I don't know, like the Trent bit is fascinating to me though, because it's like, we still don't know what we're looking to replace. And I still don't know what we're going to do if he's not there. I think the bigger question for me, rather than where is he going to play, is what are we going to do when he's not playing? Like, what's that plan? Because I have not seen a good one for that in a good few years. Does that matter to be Pavos? I think if you if you design the right um, the right side for him in a way that you know he has offensive potential and he's got a really good um, he's he's quite a good striker actually. You know he's he's got a feel for for the spaces. Uh, he's not the best guy at, at at crossing necessarily. You know he's not designed for that. He's more of a receiver of crosses. Going into going into the attacking zone, so um, I think if you design that well for him, that is a really good role because you can have him as sort of a holding holding person in the back, holding player who's more defensively um, um, situated and you know helps the the central defenders um, in 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 defense uh, and offensively just you know enters more or less enters the penalty area maybe and if, so designing that role for him that can really work very well but i have to say that he's also turned out to be a really good central defender in many ways that he's very communicative you know he's he's because at bayern there was a clear lack of, of communication at the, at the beginning of the season and he's someone um, if you ask you know matthias de licht who's been playing next to him in the last few games of the season now de licht was always pronouncing or pronouncing or, or, or stressing that he had a very good communication with Favar and, and that was a good quality which obviously very is very important for, for the two defenders back there. So I think that, that could work very well and I have to see I I like to see him in both and he's he's a very solid, very, very solid player in both roles. He had just played a an, an very well very good World Cup. He's you know been playing at Stuttgart he was playing this this very centered role in a in a team that wasn't working very well back then, but you know he obviously had great potential. He was still very young, 
French player, which, you know, at Bayern, there's a good history of French players, especially back then they had plenty of French players around. So, yeah, there was a lot of excitement around him then. And, you know, it proved right because the last few years he's just been really developing into a very, very, um, you know, safe player, someone you could really rely on no matter where he played exactly and how, what, what role you put him in at Bayern Munich. He, he performed really well. And uh, I have to say that, you know, he's he's become sort of a really important player for Bayern Munich in those years. And going back, I wouldn't have expected that necessarily. I always expected him to be a good, good addition to the, to the team, but not necessarily someone who could lead, which he turned out to be. I said, I'm not seeing a good one. I have concerns about his actual defending ability. I feel like he's dropped off a little bit these last two years. He might say differently. Giordano with a chance as well. Not, not to be that person, but... Well, yeah, but... Do you need to defend as well? But that's the thing. It's like, if we're going to get a guy who's a, a, to do some of the defending, when so Trent can't, he needs to be good at defending. We can't have two that are kind of all right. We need one to be actually really solid. And yeah, he would probably argue, yeah. uh, but I just think he slipped off a little bit. So, so just on the Trent thing, because we talk about we need somebody who can really defend as well. Well, we, hadn't, we didn't need that up until last season when all of a sudden we sort of caved and our midfield fell apart, really. Um, if we are signing these midfielders who can do a lot more of that defending, then I think we'll be all right in that sense. I don't think we necessarily need to think about it because, you know, Gomez hasn't really played, we didn't really play right back, did he, at all last year? And I think, I feel like that's probably his, his, his best way in next year is playing right back when Trent's not playing or when Trent's further forward. Um, so I'm, I'm less sort of concerned about that one, to be honest. I think we might see a bit of Gomez left back as well. Yeah, it depends on Shimmer Cash, yeah, yeah. but I think, don't forget, I think he made his debut at left back for Liverpool. He, did, yeah. um, he played there for Charlton. And I think with this Trent role, you need somebody who's comfortable as playing as a left side, the centre half, essentially. Yeah. Gomez, to me, you know, uh, Levi Colwell is, is, is the dream for me, because mm -hmm. I think he's sort of the, 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 the follow on from Van Dijk in two, three years' time, potentially. But for now, you know, I think Gomez has, has probably got the skill set there to, to back up Roberts. Yeah. It's gonna have to, on that, you know, that's why I think Pavard was interesting because I can sort of see them possibly deciding to, to move Matip on or Matip himself deciding to move on because, you know, he can probably get a better deal now than he could in 12 months. Normally when a player's on a three, it doesn't feel like that, but it feels like one more year on now might be, it might be a little bit difficult for him, especially if he doesn't get that much football next yeah. year. I sort of wonder whether or not they will want to do two and the two of them will be quite centre half -y in conjunction with Gomez. Fluidity feels like the new normal, and I do sort of wonder if it'll be a couple who look like they can do bits in, in a number of different areas and a number of different ways. And I mean, Colwell is the dream, I think, the way he passes the ball first and foremost. He's, he's a brilliant passer of the ball, he wins headers, he's big, he's, he's English, which is, which is important, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's homegrown, um, he's Premier League proven, and he weakens one of Liverpool's three rescue rivals. Um, and that's what I would really like because you know obviously Chelsea are in a bit of flux at the moment. They've got about 70 million players. Yeah. How do we actually, can we actually take one and of the no best ones? No one's locked it down yet. No, that's really interesting. And I think he makes so much sense. It's almost scary how much sense he makes. And you know, we this is how like a man's Van Dyke. Van Dyke's 32 now, 31, 32. He will be 32 at the end of next season. 32 at the end of next season. What's he going to look like in two years' time? What you can do in, in a year or two is say to someone like Colwell. Look, you'll get minutes to left back because mm -hmm. Robertson can't play every game. This is assuming we, we, we move on to Shimakas because it's not necessarily against Shimakas, he just feels like having a specialist left back. As you say, fluidity yeah. is, the, is the name of the yeah. game now. Having a specialist left back who just sits on the bench doesn't really work. So you get minutes to left back, probably in the Europa League, whenever. You'll back up Van Dyke when you need to. And hopefully in 12, 18, 24 months' time, we've got somebody there who can essentially take over Virgil van Dijk. Yeah. We need to start thinking about the succession plan yeah. for, for basically Virgil and Mo at some point over the next 12 months. Mo will play since 45. Well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you seen yeah. him? No, I, I, I agree with you. I think we did really, like, kind of well with the forwards, as in we kind of replaced while they were still there, because obviously it gives you the benefit of learning from them as well. Uh, obviously, I haven't quite done it as well in the midfield, but I do think it's something we absolutely have to think about with Van Dijk because he has been so important. And the idea of him leaving and then someone else is coming, we're buying someone in to go, there you go, you're the new Van Dijk. I yeah. just think that's too much to put on someone. And even if they are an established player that we end up buying in that position, although I don't think we will. So, someone like that who can do something else as well while they're learning on the job. 
that's perfect. I love Colwell as well. I think he's a really good talent. My worry with him is the whole Brighton Chelsea business. Because there was a thing out today where Brighton has said, 100 million pounds for Caicedo. That's it. That's the price, 100 million. And everyone else has just gone. But now he looks like Chelsea, only ones you want him. So it's like, okay, well, Chelsea, if you want to pay 100 million pounds for Caicedo, give us 100 million pounds. If you want to pay 80 million pounds for Caicedo, yeah. come to the table on Colwell. And I feel like that's what Brighton are doing all year. And it makes sense to them. And it. whether or not Chelsea want Caicedo enough to do that, I don't know. But then... Brighton are th- fascinating because ultimately we had their kex down for, for McAllister. You know, we've, so they've got every single aspect of their transfer strategy nailed. You look at all the young players who are coming through, where they're plucking them from, it's fantastic. What they're not really proven at the minute is that they can sell players really well. Mm. And that'll be the next source, and I'll be really interested well, in did last year, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Cucurella last year to Chelsea. That's fair, yeah. I don't support us. We, we, on Caicedo, I think what's interesting for Brighton is I think there's a bit of a PR thing around Chelsea internally, so I think they almost need to get Colwell mm. in to be able to say, well, we've done this and we pulled this yeah. out the bag. My worry is that what Brighton are able to offer, or not just Brighton, but other clubs who aren't established top six clubs that we can't offer to buy back. That's what we can't offer. So we can't say, we'll give you 45 million, but your buyback's 55. And it's, it, you can action it in two years. We can't offer that because yeah. he, we, we, we're, we're, we're doing the, you're this, you're this, you're this. So that could do Chelsea for now, where they get to, with all the issues they've got with the books, sort that out yeah, yeah. Yeah. for a short period. And no, we can always action that back as and when we want to. It's in my thing about the whole buyback course thing in general. Like, as a human, like, if you're a player, and they're like, Actually, no, you, you, can, you can fuck off now, but if you're good, we want you back. I can't believe the casualness with which people die. I'll, I'll be livid. Yeah, I'm a cross steward. You should sell Keller, but put a buy back in. If I was Keller, I could go fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, has <laughs> anyone ever bought back, though? Like, do you ever see anyone buy back? So I think so. Madrid did it a couple of times, mm. and once I think to then sell on immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to buy you back because they'll pay that much. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Buy that. It was effect- yeah. it was effectively just moving, but the money was only investing in someone's account. <laughs> <laughs> it was that nature that of buy back. Sounds illegal, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I ge- genuinely, if I was a footballer, I would that would yeah. be my, my yeah. attitude would be go fuck yourselves. Yeah. And I would absolutely be scoring every time I play against them and yeah. giving the finger to all yeah. four corners of the ground yeah. every. Single time, yeah. No, well, I mean, all, more, more celebrations, uh, more celebrations when you've scored. I, honestly, I'm bang into that. If Chamberlain or Milner scored against us next season, <laughs> if Milner scores a pen against us and he doesn't celebrate, I'll be angry <laughs> when he took the NBA. No, no it's, it's gonna do a penenka, that'll be it. Yeah, actually, I, I, on the cop ends, just a little penenka. Yeah. I, I always remember, I think it was Scott Sinclair went to Chelsea, he chewed them up, spat them out, he scored against them like the winner of Stamford Bridge, refused to celebrate. It's like, <laughs> He's got a yellow card and take his top off and not his shorts. <laughs> no, he's short. Uh, the, the question is, Sean, I don't know what you think. Do you think you need an attacking midfielder? Go, go on to listen to the, the, the yeah. profile, but do you think you need one who looks like he, he looks like a bit more of an obvious sort of goal scorer midfielder, or do you think. Listen, we never had that in the past. Yeah, I, I don't. And, and the reason why is because we've got so many strikers. <laughs> um, the reason why I think we may need one is, is because of the strikers' injury records, and we know it's not squeaky clean because we've been in a situation before, you know, like Klopp's famous quotes about how many midfielders we had last year, and we, and we know how that went. Um, but I actually don't. I think, I feel like we should have enough. We should have enough goals in the team. And you think about when we've been successful, we, there was never really any goals from midfield. Um, the last midfielder I can think of to score goals for us was probably Coutinho. And it's like, was he really a midfielder? Was he not? So I'm actually more interested in the industry, like the, the real sort of Taram style players who are going to come in and, and, and shore us up because I feel like that's what we've missed the most. I feel like the goals, when we, when we get the, the back half of this pitch right, the goals, the goals flow. You see in the back end of the season when we were more solid, we could say, we go to Leeds and our Leeds winning the best days at that time. But we go to Leeds and we can just score six. And you get, you, I was back in the position where I'd go into a game thinking, when it clicks, we can score five or six today. And I haven't been in that position for a while. So leave, like, from what we've seen at the end of last season, knowing that we've got strikers who should, you know, think about Nunes coming into his second season. Um, you know, it's a debate, debatable whether he's going to, you know, be the start and centre forward next year or not, given how good Gakpo's been. Um, but you've got to be expecting more goals from him. So I'd be like, and he's used to score more goals before they go and sign him in the field to score goals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think it's. I think it's an argument. I'm just intrigued by the fact that the Vegas stuff's not going anywhere. Mm. And also, how it originally emerged was Newcastle, the Newcastle whole 
Well, Vega looks like he's destined for Liverpool, and it makes me sort of think Liverpool have agreed something with Vega, and they may or may not do it. Yeah, Newcastle have been a bit odd so far in the transfer window. It's almost like act like you've been here before, guys. Like, oh yeah, we're definitely going to sign Barella for fifty million. It's like, are you? Are you? But Vega, I think he's someone who's definitely been on our radar for a long time, and it's one of those where it, he's got a set price, he's got a release clause, so you know what it is, and it's just a case of. Do we think we need on top of X, Y, and Z? It might be one that goes late. Like I was speaking to um, you and Matir for the yeah. European show coming up soon, um, and he was very much like the way that he ended the season. It looked like a goodbye. It looked like Celta are going to sell him to someone regardless. So again, that probably suits Liverpool to be able to be like, okay, you can almost have that a little bit on the back burner, particularly if other clubs don't think that they have a chance with it. So I think. In terms of goals from midfield, I think it's also going to be played in that tournament, yeah. which also yeah. limits the like the idea of what's the first day you can turn up. If yeah. you know what I mean, and, and, it's, and you've got a release clause, and you know what the first day you can turn up is. And I just sort of wonder, Chris, if Liverpool will be seeing if anything else emerges, testing some waters. They know how much he wants, and they know that he wants to come. It all feels a little bit to me like this is one we start this off saying we'll need about time in a couple of ways. This is one where if you literally can't. You know, let's say it's a week. Let's say they're going to give them a week off after they go out of this tournament. So if Liverpool know that basically from the day Spain go out, he wouldn't be turning up anyway for seven more days. That might be when Liverpool decide to do it. If nothing else has popped up, that they like. Yeah, I don't know if you call him a backup or a bonus. Yeah. I think that's essentially what it what, what he feels like to me. Where if the deal's already in place, or if we're sort of working on a deal, or we sort of we sort of look at it after they go out and go, wait, where are we up to? What does the squad look like? Who have we got? 30 million, should we do it? Yeah, should we yeah. save 20 on McAllister? Should, should, should we go and do yeah. it? And it feels like, you know, because we haven't got any players like that. We maybe got Elliot, yeah. maybe got Elliot, but it, we, are we getting output from Elliot? Really? Are we getting output? Well, so, I, I, wonder, I wonder what Elliot would think about that, to be honest. Like, <laughs> if we, we bring in Gabby Vega, because like. It would feel like it would feel like a very much like your, your place in this squad is under threat. Exactly. Now, this lad, so yeah, and, do what you should be doing. And I kind of have some sympathy for him. I mean, yes, the re- if he was scoring 10 goals in the season, then obviously we wouldn't be having this conversation because there would be no output question. But, like, he played every game. For like, well, it felt like the first half, maybe two yeah, thirds of the season. Of the season. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was literally the only guy who, every single game, they called upon him. And to be in from that position, to be like, actually, well, I think we're going to upgrade on you. Like, literally, within the space of a few months. Yeah, yeah. I can understand his head spinning a bit, but hey, that's Liverpool. That's, that's life at a big club sometimes. I, I, I think you're spot on, though, in the sense of it, it almost feels like, hey, where are we at? And then let's see what happens. There was a, this is going to be a really bad podcast and video casting, but there's a lot from PSG who played about a thousand minutes and we beat the Grim in France. And I can't remember his name, double barrel, really bad. Warren Zaire Emery. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> and they were going to rely on you, Mo. <laughs> and it feels like it's that kind of thing where it's a bit like, there's just a situation where we get to a point in the summer and go, should we just do it? Yeah. Should we, should we just have a go? Just give us a little bit of an X factor. Let's go for it. We know what we want otherwise, but that's the one where we go, right? Okay. Young player, someone who, who's got a little bit in, in the locker, but let's go for it. Yeah, quite interesting indeed. I tell you what, Liverpool's gorgeous. Pins' rooftop garden's gorgeous. Uh, Sean O'Donnell's gorgeous. So is Mo Stewart and so is Chris Walsh. It's Liverpool in the sunshine, it's Liverpool in the summer, and may it never, ever, ever end.